You ready? Yep. Okay, we're rolling. Hey, welcome back to another episode of In the Chair with the Barber podcast. My name is Bandy Golau. As you can see, we're not in the barber shop today. Um, we're in a beautiful little historic church, uh, the Holy Father's Greek Orthodox Church in Shrewsbury, Shropshire. With that, I'm blessed to be sat with the priest of the church, my personal longtime priest, Father Stephen Maxfield. Firstly, I'd like to thank you because um, I've heard that you weren't always one for videos. Yes. <laughs> All uh, right. <laughs> um, so, so I'm honoured that you're you're sitting down with us to do this. Uh, the purpose of this episode is to cover some of the what I believe are the misconceptions of religion, more so of Christianity. Um, we're not here to force our beliefs down people's throats. Um, rather to give our opposing opinions on some of the reasons why people don't follow religion or believe in God. Um, I personally feel many people haven't been educated on it fully. Uh, some of their arguments against religions or God have never been logically opposed. So they kind of hear something that somebody else has said and that's enough for them and they go with it and then when it gets questioned they don't really know because it's not really their opinion mm. um yeah because they've never had to think about it deeper they just live the rest of their lives with that assumption um uh, one of the other things is the only time they ever hear about religion in the media is always negative why i don't know again i think it's a bit of a conspiracy <laughs> But there you go. Um, people that do believe in many cases aren't educated enough on it or brave enough to debate it. Yeah, so that's true. I think that I think as soon as it becomes a um, a debate, let's say somebody that may believe personally believe is a bit too scared to debate it because they don't know what's going to be said they don't know if it's going to be too intellectual of an argument for them to go into um i feel like some people don't want to be mocked so they're too scared and they just won't bother mm. yep um and so i guess that's why we're doing this before we get into that uh let's quickly give a bit of information about you Right. Um, unlike me, you weren't raised in the Greek Orthodox religion. No. Um, you converted into it. Why? Uh, right. Let's go back a bit. Um, I had, I suppose, what would for many people be in the 50s and early 60s, the sort of ordinary... Uh, school religion we had every day we had a um an assembly we went to the chapel we had a prayer we had a hymn we had a reading uh that was sort of my background my mother was somebody who would go to church probably once a month my father i think probably thought that when he because he was a teacher when he was um at school he had had enough of it um, so I was brought up with that kind of not very intense but background religious experience. There was something. There was there was something, but I wouldn't have said I was a, a believer. Then, then probably when I was fifteen, no, fourteen, fifteen, I got very interested in all sorts of Eastern religions. Uh, Buddhism, Taoism, uh, Sikhism, Hinduism, um, m magic, uh, occult things, you know, lot, lot, as many teenagers do. I was searching around. I can't say that I, I can't say that I, I sort of really took on any of them to say I was this yeah. because I, I wasn't. Um, on the other hand, I tended to reject Christianity because I thought it was. Uh, uh, you know, an uh, an old man with a white beard in the, in the sky who just was a sort of 
uh, interfered with everybody's life. Right. And Which a lot of people actually think. Yes, that's right. Uh, and that, that all seemed to me to be quite ridiculous. And, uh, and so I was looking at these other things. And then... I had a conversion experience, which we might talk about, but I suddenly knew, and I had this very intense sense, that Christ was absolutely next door to me. I could touch him. How how old were you at the time? I was 21. Okay. Um, and from that, I felt uh, that I ought to become a priest. I became an Anglican priest. Uh, which I was for five years, I then converted to orthodoxy. Um, there were all sorts of reasons for that, but fundamentally it is that in orthodoxy there is a clearly defined belief which we all hold to. We all hold to. We don't have different opinions about it. And that is an enormous strength for uh, anybody who is searching for religion to know, right, well, here they are. They do have many of the answers. We don't have all the answers, but we do have many of the answers. And it is a place where we can actually experience God. Because, you see, religion is not just about, and, and Christianity is not just about reading the Bible or 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 reading particular prayers. It's actually about having a relationship with the God who loves us. So probably we ought to start off by talking a little bit about God. Okay. Just before I get into that, can you just talk a touch louder? All right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so. what? Uh, ju sorry, just to cut you off, because <coughs> you were... You're well educated, but there, there was things that you were doing before you were a priest. Yes, I, I've got a rather strange education. Um, I started off in horticulture, and I was a nurseryman growing trees and shrubs. Okay. And I worked on a nursery and um, in Woking and in uh, near Winchester. So I've retained a considerable interest in plants, and oddly enough. Well, that was one of the things working it was working on a tree nursery where you know if you uh, follow darwin you're told that there are supposed to be all these mutations yeah okay you need, to, you need to have regular mutations in order for something to develop well we used to grow this stuff called i'm sure they still grow it sitka spruce and we used to grow millions and millions and millions of them probably 20, 30 million. Okay. And you, we grew these things. We grew them from seed. We, we planted them out. We got bigger and so on. The mutations practically never happened. <laughs> and if they did happen, they died. Okay. Yeah? Yeah. So I thought, well, you know, there's, there's probably a bit more to this than, than meets the eye. <laughs> okay. So... Uh, we'll get into it. So my plan for today is um, to raise up a reason why people may not believe. Um, I'll give my opinion on it. You can give your opinion and drop some actual knowledge on it. Um, we'll discuss it and then we'll move on to the next one. Okay. Um, there, is quite, there is quite a bit to cover. So if you're watching, you may want to get comfortable. Um. <laughs> Before we discuss religion, we should discuss God and the theories of creation. All right. Uh, so, the, there are various definitions for God, but the one that I think probably is most helpful is to say, God is that greater than which nothing can be deemed to exist. Right? God is that greater than which nothing can be deemed to exist okay so if we look out uh into the sky on a starlit night and we see all these stars and we know that they're not just stars there are galaxies and there's even a place in the in the universe where it looks as if another universe is moving in onto our universe 
there is the thing that they call the Great Attractor, where our galaxy seems to be going at an incredible speed towards this thing. We don't know what it is or where it is or anything about it. God is greater than all of that. But actually, in orthodox understanding, we tend to talk about God not in terms of what he is, but in terms of what we can't say about him. Okay. So, for instance, in the liturgy, we say this about God. For thou art God, ineffable, inconceivable, invisible, incomprehensible, ever existing, and eternally the same. So let's unpack that. Ineffable, we can't know him. Inconceivable, we can't conceive him. Invisible, because we can't see him. Incomprehensible, because he is so far from us that we can't comprehend him. Ever existing, ever existing. He, there's never been a time when he hasn't existed, and there will never be a time when he won't exist. And he is eternally the same right right he doesn't change his mind okay all right yeah and we talk about him as he because he has been revealed to us in the new testament all right in the old testament as well but certainly in the new testament as he but when we say he it would be daft to think about uh, different sexes and you know male or female anything else it is a way of expressing something and people and we have to use words people get caught off on that sometimes don't they oh yes yes but you know we have to use words yeah yeah, yeah. We, we can't we can't we can't do it in sign language yeah well i suppose we could but we, you still are using words <laughs> yeah you can't we can't avoid words but so therefore the next thing about god is that he is the creator right if he is the creator and he creates everything from non-existence now that is a very important aspect of our understanding you can't really say nothing because nothing implies something you have to say non-existence okay so absolutely no existence at all god creates everything in the universe from that right. over who knows yeah over a long period of time yeah so it talks in the bible about seven days but it wasn't actually seven 24 hour days well yeah, but now we, we, we will talk about the Bible in a moment. You see, the the thing there is that um, in Hebrew, and we're talking about something that was written down something like 1000, 1500 BC. In Hebrew, there are very few abstract nouns. Okay. So you can't say things like time. You have to make it concrete. So... A con so in the first chapter of Genesis, the time is and there was evening and there was morning one day, right? right. Because that gives you time. Yeah. A time. Yeah. Um, and don't forget that at that time, when they wanted to know when the new moon rose, because there were specific things in the temple that took place, there were sacrifices and so on that took place in the temple, they had to have a man who ran up to the top of the hill to watch to see when it rose yeah. and the moment it rose he legged it all the way down yeah you know they're not working in we work with with watches and months and years and seconds and all they the rest didn't of it. have that they didn't have that no okay all right so we think of him as the creator now you i suspect want to talk to me about uh science and creation yeah we we need to um, cover that in some form of detail because my debate when I talk about religion versus non-religion and God versus no God to people, I'd say to them, if you don't believe in God, how do you believe the world started? Because there's a difference between believing God and following a religion. Oh, yes. And... If you, if you are going to say that there is no God, you have to have some kind of understanding or some kind of belief of how we came apart, how, how we came to be. If uh, you think about it. Yeah. If you're prepared to think about it. Yeah. Yes. So one of the theories is obviously the theory of evolution, which they believe 
occurred billions of years ago. Um, or occurs. Or occurs. Yeah, yeah occurs. Um, to obviously believe that we're still evolving. And we are, th- there's definitely elements of evolution. But whether we evolved from an organism is what I personally don't believe. Um, again, th- they say that there's science that backs it. The problem I personally have with that is that where people may say, oh, well, you believe um, a man in the sky and you've got no proof. Well, actually, the people that believe in evolution don't actually have that much proof either because the technology that they use to figure that something happened billions of years ago, that technology was only made, I don't know, 10, 20, 30 years ago? Recently. Yeah. Recently. Um, and they weren't there to see it. The people that told them about it weren't there to see it either. So as much belief as we have in God, which they find hard to understand, they also have that same amount of belief in the theory of evolution. My yes, it's, a, it's, a, it's as much to do with faith. Yeah. It's as much to do with faith as, as, as religious belief is. Yeah. All right, bam. Before we go there, let's just have a look at uh, some thoughts about the Bible. Okay? Okay. So, as far as Christians are concerned, the Bible is divided into two. There is the New Testament, and the New Testament for us, as Orthodox, is much more important than the Old Testament. Yes. Okay? Uh, then there is the Old Testament. Now, the Old Testament is a collection of different books. There are hymns. There are historical stories. Uh, there are mm, legends. There are stories put together in order to try to help you to understand something. Uh, there is wisdom. There are a lot in, in the Bible uh, to tell you, you know, this is a good idea and this, this, this is not a good idea and you should do this and you shouldn't do that and yeah. so on. Uh, not necessarily commandments, but just guides for life. So there are all these things fitted together, slotted together uh, and put into a book. Right. Yeah. Now, the difficulty with that is that some of it was written in Hebrew, some of it was written in Greek. And most of the Bibles that you'll find in English now will put those books that were uh, written, they think, in Greek, uh, either they call them the Apocrypha, or they won't put them in at all. Okay. Right? Now, these books we now know because of the excavation and discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls in the 50s, many of them did exist and do exist in Hebrew, but we didn't, we hadn't got them. Okay. And so there's that. And they also, as far as the Orthodox Church is concerned, we think of the Bible as being in Greek, the Old Testament in Greek and the New Testament in Greek. Okay. Now, the Old Testament Greek was translated uh after Alexander the Great. So we're talking about the 3rd century BC. Okay. Now, if you compare the Greek with the Hebrew, you would think that the Hebrew was bef- was first and was a better translation. But actually, uh, if the Greek is to be thinking about sort of 300 BC, um, the most of the books of the Old Testament that are used are either from 200 AD or, in the form that we now have it, 1000 AD, by which time quite a lot has happened. Because don't forget, up until the invention of printing, all these things were written out by hand. Yeah. So if a scribe, you know, he had a glass of water or something, he might miss a word. He, <laughs> yeah. he, he, you know, he might yeah. mash it up. And yeah. we know that this happens there are, from the text we've got. We know that this happens. But uh, just to interrupt you there, this seems to be an issue for people as well because they say, well, men wrote the Bible, so how do we, how do we trust that? Well, they did write the Bible. I mean, they're absolutely right. Yeah. If you if you take the view 
as uh, there are quite a lot of, of, of Protestants do, that the Bible is absolutely inerrant. And we will come back to this because this is a very important thing to do when we think about creation. Okay. That it is inerrant. There are no errors in the Bible. Uh, it was almost a book in the sky that comes zooming down in nice calfskin uh, <laughs> covers. And all right. It's not like that. Okay. It's not like that. And we know, for instance, that the that uh, the Greek that we have in the Septuagint, that's the Greek Old Testament, from the Dead Sea Scrolls, we know that the Septuagint is much closer in many respects to an original. Okay. Now there's another thing, which is that the various different churches aren't necessarily agreeing with what uh, which books we're going to put in the Old Testament. Okay. And in the New Testament, for instance, they talk about, St. Paul knew, and St. Jude talks about, the book of Enoch. Well, you won't find it's the book of in, Enoch. It's not in the Bible. It's not in the Bible. Right. But if you know what was in the book of Enoch, it makes the explanation of some of the things in the New Testament much easier to understand. Okay. All right? Now, so we cannot, it is it, uh, it completely illogical to think of it as inerrant. There are errors. I'll give you an example. If you look in the book of Exodus, so this is Exodus 20, you shall not make for yourself an idol or likeness of anything whatever is in heaven above and whatever is in the earth beneath and whatever is in the waters beneath the earth. You shall not do obeisance to them, nor are you to serve them, for I am the Lord your God, a jealous God, and so on. You go on a small number of chapter of chapters so that was the, the chapter 20 we now go to chapter 25 and it talks about here propitiatory well this is the in the, the part of what's in the temple you shall make a pr pr propitiatory as a cover of pure gold the length two and a half cubits and the width one and a half cubits and you shall make two cherubim engraved in gold and you shall position them at both sides of the pr propitiatory they shall be made one cherub on this side and one cherub on the second side of the propitiatory so it's a direct contradiction in one says it says you can't make anything in the heaven above and right here we are told precisely to do that okay. so there are contradictions okay in the old testament right um and it, one of the reasons for that is it is an amalgam, many often, of different strands that have been put together, and we find them all called Exodus, or we find them called Deuteronomy, or we find them called Leviticus, or whatever it is, but they are different strands that are there together. Right. So then the significant thing is how are we to interpret this? Okay. And our understanding is that it is through long practice and experience of people who have been uh, reading the Bible over a long period of time. This this isn't something that you'll pick up the Bible once or twice and understand it. No. I've I've often said to people that it's kind of coded, and when whenever you take any form of study, you have to study it ideally in depth, but also from somebody else that has the experience and the knowledge that studied it before you. Absolutely. Now, in St. Luke's Gospel, right at the end of St. Luke's Gospel, there are two disciples walking along the road. Okay? Yeah. And they, uh, Jesus, appears. Okay. And he says to them, uh, you know, what, 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 are you, what are you talking about? And they say the things concerning Jesus the Nazarene. He was a prophet, mighty indeed, a word before God and all the people. And how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and had him crucified. But we were hoping that he was the one who would redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this today is the third day since these things have taken place. Certain women of our company have puzzled us, having arrived early at the tomb, and they did not find his body. And when they came back saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Now going on, and he said to them, that's Jesus said to them, You foolish men, slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. 
Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them in all the scriptures, by which he means the Old Testament, right. the things concerning himself. Okay. Right? So the Old Testament for us is valuable in that it tells us what to expect of the Christ. Yeah. There's a load of other stuff in there which may be wrong, contradictory, <coughs> uh, immoral, all sorts of things, which we do not have to worry about because that is not uh, revealing Christ to us. Okay, so that's that's our main focus. Yeah. Okay. Do you want to say something now about evolution and things? So what I was... <laughs> I don't... Um, I think... Did I cover it? Um what I wanted to say was with evolution, um, where they believe that we evolved from apes, for example, um, glancing over the fact that apes still exist and I don't know if they just weren't fortunate enough to evolve. But if you delve deeper into it, we actually apparently came from an organism. So... In the state of nothingness, it was just all black, and there's an organism just there chilling on its own. And then we all came from that. And this, the problem I have with this, and the problem I have with the Big Bang theory, which um, they believe 13 billion years ago, um, there was some form of explosion, and in three minutes, everything has become the problem i have with that is that everything if you take out humans and you just look at nature um you look at the way that animals function and plants function and you look at the seas and we get oxygen from waters and and trees and and the sun and all these kind of things and then even if you take humans afterwards and the fact that man and woman were designed quite perfectly to fit together and men and women have internal and external things that the other doesn't have to come together to create more life and base well i'd say basic things are not basic things but it's basic knowledge that obviously a child is born through the woman and without the man it can't be done and all these things that if you look at the woman's breasts fill with the right nutrients for the child for a certain amount of time all these kinds of things are so genius that for it to just happen by chance or by fluke i i, I can't get my head around it because there has to be a creator that it, it, my argument with the Big Bang Theory, for example, is if I gave you a blank canvas and I gave you loads of paint and I just said to you, Bade, throw all that paint at this canvas, would you make a masterpiece? Aha. Uh -huh. No. All right. Uh, okay. Let's, let's go back a bit. So for the first person to talk about evolution was in fact a man called Lamarck, and he was a Frenchman at the end of the 18th century. And he was saying that, for instance, uh, if you have, uh, you need, if you're a, a stag and you need to sort out other stags, you grow horns in order to do this. All okay. right. So the, per the, the, the organism developed in certain ways in order to deal with certain things. Now, that wasn't very uh, much thought well of. Then Darwin came along and a man called Wallace who were talking about uh, things happening uh, through natural selection. Yeah. Right. Now, remember that Darwin came from an understanding of the Bible which would put the first two books of the two, first two chapters of Genesis together. So the story of the creation from God said and it came to be, and then Adam and Eve, they were to be thought of as one 
story. Okay. And the understanding there at the beginning of the 19th century for most people, and particularly in the, in the Western churches, was that these two stories were together, it was one piece, and that everything had been created perfect right from the very beginning. Okay. So the idea of new things developing was anathema to them, both to both, to both to Darwin. I mean, he had great spiritual problems about this, but that was that was his pro that was one of his problems, and it was a problem for what that's what the church thought. Everything had been, and they talked about fossils uh, being put there by the devil to confuse us. Okay. Right. Now, in actual fact, the problem is they didn't know their Bibles, because in the first chapter of Genesis, uh, we are told God speaks, and he said, let there be light, yes. and there was light. Yep. Right. In the second chapter of Genesis, he takes things and makes something from them. Okay. So he takes dust, and it, out of dust he makes Adam. Right. He takes uh, from Adam, Adam's rib, rib yeah. and makes woman. So he takes something and does something with it. And yep. indeed, in the New Testament, we find in St. John's Gospel that there's a man born blind. He hasn't got eyes. Okay. And Christ spits on the ground, makes clay, puts it in his eyes, and creates eyes. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. But there's even another story about um, creation in in the Bible, which we find in Psalm 103 in the... In the um, Hebrew numbering, it would be 104, but in the Septuagint numbering, it's 103, which we read every single day at Vespers. And it is about God continuously creating things. Okay. So we have, we have that he creates things from non-existence. We have that he creates things from something to make something else. We have that this is a continuous process right the way through. Yep. Yeah. So their, their problem actually it was not a problem because it is not inconceivable that god will take something and create something new from it right now if you look at the the, the the geology you find that there are certain times for instance at the end of the permian age at the end of the cretaceous age when suddenly something happens and most of the things that are alive on earth disappear and something completely new comes they're dinosaurs or mammals or, or right. whatever. So I find I, I I would have no difficulty in believing that God is working through his purposes in the way that he wishes to work them through. Who knows what that is? We can't understand yeah. the mind of God. Yeah. I mean, a thousand years ago, one of the great Orthodox saints, St. Simon the New Theologian, said, what can a plow know of its creator? Yep. Yeah. So we are the plow. Yeah. God is the creator. Yeah. What can we know of him? Yeah. So the Big Bang, well, the fun, one of the funny things I think about the Big Bang is, you know, they're trying to work out how the laws of physics, and don't forget those are created by God. Yeah. How is it that the laws of physics suddenly seem to change within a matter of fractions of a second? They don't know. And they're trying to find out. Well, you know, they can they can go on. The fact is, there is a mystery here, a mystery meaning something we cannot ever stop knowing more about. So the mystery is that, yes, all the things that we have around us is created by God. And how he does it, we probably shall never know. The, <laughs> the, the problem is people, a lot of people want concrete answers, which you've discussed already the bible can't give all the answers we don't know all the answers also the fact that it's within a book of fair size but what i would like to say is that if you take a celebrity and you take his autobiography if let's say this celebrity is 60 70 years old even 50 years old not every single part of his life and every single story of his life will be in that book. One of the reasons is because it just wouldn't fit. So you can't expect millions or billions of years of information to all be piled in a book. So No, and that and, and Ban, that's not what the book's for. 
the purpose of the book, the purpose of the Bible, is to help us to know God. Right. It's about a relationship. But everybody, well, again, a lot of people that don't believe expect that we, we should have all the answers. Otherwise, it's not worth believing because we don't have all the answers. But then they don't have all the answers either. No. So no. it's it's the same thing, but different. We cannot have all the answers. No, that's that's what's put beyond us. That's what faith is for. One of my um, one of my customers who I was discussing this with, he said to me, "It's kind of like trying to talk to a fish and tell him about the internet." Yes, it it just exactly. it just wouldn't work. And just because we don't understand something, it doesn't mean it's not real. No, absolutely. Okay, so we'll move on. Um, where are we? Uh, okay. Again, tied into that, God isn't real because science disproved it. Well, you can't disprove him. No. It, 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 if you start off by saying God is the creator and everything is from non-existence, he is of a completely different order to everything that we have around us. Right. So here we are, wood. Here we are, carpet, you know, books, all the rest of it. These things around us are all part of creation. Yeah. Time. Yeah. Space. Everything is part of creation. He is not. He's a completely different order of being to us. So we don't have the tools because if I want to if I want to prove or disprove something, I can only prove or disprove what I have the tools to use. Yeah. Okay? Which are creation. Yeah. A creation cannot Prove or disprove God. Just impossible. It's the wrong... We're using... We're, we're, we're trying to catch a fish in the air. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And also, if your mind can't comprehend it, then it stops. Exactly. Um, and also, there's scientists that do believe in God. So, if it was so obvious that science disproved God, then surely there would be no scientists that do believe in God. Um, the next one... If there is a God, why do people get ill or why is there poor people? Ah. So my personal thing about why there's poor people is because there's a lot of greed in the world. Actually, there's enough money and resources and materials to be shared out evenly and fairly amongst everybody and everybody would have enough. For example, there is countries in Africa that are... The governments are very rich. Their people have got nothing. There's celebrities with 1 million, 18 million pound watches. That's a lot of poor people that they could be helping. Um, so when we ask this question, that's not actually God's fault. God will provide something and as humans we do as we please with what we've been given so if it was distributed fairly or more people with um the ability to help did help then we'd all live a lot more um equally so i think that's that's one thing to to mention about that right yes uh, well i don't agree, i don't disagree with anything you say there um it is it is obviously true uh and there are circumstances which people find themselves in where, for one reason or another, they are born into an age where that particular part of the world um, is having a famine or, or is... Uh, now, that is a, an, another question, of course. Why is it that God has created the world where um, there seem to be such weird imperfections, you know, I mean, the obvious one is a volcano. A volcano can do an enormous amount of damage, a yeah. vast, colossal amount of damage. Yeah. But the soil that then comes from volcanoes makes it possible to grow crops. In actual fact, I read somewhere that you, if there had been no volcanoes, there would be no agriculture. Wow. So it, volcanoes are really important. Yeah. They, are, they are a blessing. But they're not such a blessing if you are fried at the top of a hill. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so the, there are there are these things that go on, uh, um, and there are two things as well. 
there are things where human beings are sinful and bring about uh, bad things for other people. Yes. It doesn't just mean uh, murderers. Yeah. It means the way they use the resources of the world yeah. are ridiculous yeah. and, and wasteful. And, and our age, our age, is full of that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, these things go together. Now, why is the world imperfect? The, the answer to this, and it's actually a, r rather a, a complicated thing which you need to think about, the answer to this is that what does, why has God created us in this world? He's created us so that we can have a relationship with him. Okay. Right? Yeah. So that we can love him. Now, if love is real, it has to be free. Right. Okay? Yeah. If God makes it so that we have no option but to love him, yes. we can't love him because it's not free love. No. Therefore, there has to be a world where there is never going to be a absolute proof of God. Because if there was, if there was, then we would have to love him. Right. Okay? Yeah. So love is a free thing, and he has created a world where whatever happens to us, whatever the circumstances we're born in, we can, in fact know him and learn to love him right okay i like that uh, this is this is another popular one religion is the cause of war what i want to mention about this is there may be wars over religion however the new testament of the bible the main essence of the New Testament of the Bible is love and it's peace. Um, and peace. Jesus said, love thy neighbor. Me as a Christian, if I go and attack a non-Christian, for example, whatever he is, Jew, Sikh, Muslim, whatever. Um, and the media may pick it up and say, oh, it was over religion. Maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. Even if it was. That's not my religion's fault. That's me as a bad Christian. God is not to blame. Christianity is not to blame for everybody's individual actions. Um, a lot of wars are caused over deeper things. All, every war, money, um, land, oil, yeah. all sorts of things. But again, it's the easy option to say, well... It's religion. It's it's not. There have been wars over religion. Uh, for instance, in the 16th century, there in the 16th 17th century, there were wars in France and Germany between the Catholics and the Protestants. Okay. Uh, so you you somebody who says you know they cause wars. Well, sometimes I'm sorry to say, actually that is true. Okay. But the Orthodox Church has not been involved in those wars unless we have been attacked by someone right and there is a difference you know yeah, if yeah. you are attacked yeah then you you have to say well am i going to just die yeah or, or am i going to defend what i hold to be yeah. to be real yeah and certainly i mean you know uh constantinople where which is the sort of the heart of orthodoxy there were these enormous walls built to keep out people who wanted to attack constantinople yeah and we would none of us be Christians but for those walls. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> I I heard people say uh, religion should be banned because of all the bad things that came from it. An arrogant, an arrogant statement, really. Um, bad things come from all sorts of things. For example, if we use that mentality, why don't they ban football? Uh, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of problems that come from football, violence, racism. So if we're just going to ban things, corruption, corruption. If we're just going to ban things because bad things come from it, then we'd have nothing left. Yeah. Um, also, the media and what the average person that doesn't really have a a religious belief, 
they're only exposed uh they're only exposed to negative things that are put on social media or that are come from the news about religion so they'll see the bad things they don't see the good things they don't see how many churches and how many religious people help the poor and the needy um all these kind of things these are things and not just our religion a lot of religions a lot of um people with faith help they don't talk about that so religion is not all bad um but again they're ignorant statements Mm. um and they just tend to pick and choose the the bits that they feel strongly about that have evidence that back their side and then they go with it um you've said already the bible contradicts it uh, people ask uh why the bible contradicts itself and you've you've discussed that already is there anything else that you want to put into that no, n- not really, it, but I would underline the fact that the Bible is there to tell us something about God, and it, it there is a development in the, Bi- in the in the Old Testament, there's a development. It works through from uh, many gods to a superior god okay. to one god. Right. So it, there is a development. We can see the development come through, and you end up with one god. Now... Uh, in Christianity, of course, we we believe in the Holy Trinity, Father, right. Son, and Holy Spirit. Yeah. Now that isn't three gods; no. that is one. Yeah. And that's a very difficult thing to uh, for many people to understand. But I think perhaps a way of thinking about it. I wouldn't want to say this is a, a theological definition, but a way of thinking about it is that we experience God as Jesus Christ. We experience Him. As the Holy Spirit, we experience Him certainly in the texts as the Father. Because we experience Him like that doesn't mean that He isn't one. But how He, how we relate to this, is through the Holy Trinity. Um, there are definitions of of the Holy Trinity which allow for a wide range of understanding. Um, so, and that's what we would would use in the creed. So this is, a, but this, we believe in God, and it is one. Yes, right. Okay. Okay. Um, what are your views on people not following religion because there are corrupt priests and churches? Right. Well, if I think about, let's start with corrupt churches uh one of the advantages about being an orthodox christian is that you find yourself in a church where people have a wide range of views about things but they all all believe in the same faith okay yeah but there are also uh spin-offs from that which come up with some very strange ideas. And certainly in America, at the moment, you will find a number of sects, uh, and I don't think sect is the right word, these are small groups of people, usually Within. around a particular leader, who come up with some really weird ideas. And very often you find that what's at the back of it is that the the leader of this has a very grand lifestyle and he's doing jolly well and he has lots of money and lots of sex and lots of power. Uh, And people tend, you know, some people get hooked into this. Yes, so there's that. Then, Then the fact is that although one would like it otherwise, there are people who are become priests who maybe come become priests for very sincere reasons but for one reason or another they go off the rails yeah and they may become corrupt and be only interested in money they may be only interested in power they may be only interested in sex and it might be that it is deviant sex and they have some strange desires and habits which then harm other people. All those things harm yeah, other people. Yeah, yeah. Now, 
the church tries to deal with that. Um, it, as far as the Orthodox Church is concerned, you know, if somebody turns out to be immoral, then of they, any reason, they yes, yeah, so they they whatever reason yeah. they they are deposed. You know, they're no longer allowed to be priests. Okay. Um, in theory, that should happen in other churches, but in actual practice, it seems that it hasn't always happened as well as it ought to have done. Right. Um, what I'd say is, because I've heard people say, well, I don't go, go to church and I don't follow religion and whatever else because the priest is corrupt, for example. And I kind of think, well, imagine it's judgment day. And Christ himself is standing in front of you and he says, why didn't you go to church? And you said, well, because the priest was corrupt. I'm not Jesus. I can't speak for him. But what I'd assume he'd say is, why didn't you just go to another priest? I mean, it's not it's not the be all and end all. I think, again, it's an excuse which people use to justify the reason why they don't follow. Well, I'll tell you a story. Uh, in the 30s, when the per the persecution um, was at its height in the Soviet Union, so priests and bishops and so on were being rounded up, sent into the gulags, uh, killed and all the rest of it, the Soviet state found a hundred of what they thought were the most corrupt clergy, bishops and priests, the most corrupt, the people who... Uh, were married where they ought to, oughtn't to have been married, who did all sorts of ghastly things, all right? And they lined them up, and they came to the first one and said, we want you to deny Christ and say why you are, you are not a believer. Okay. And he said, I'm not going to do that. So they shot him. And they went down the entire line and they shot every single one. Wow. So although these were bad men, yeah. when it came to it, yeah. they still believed. Right. Um, and obviously, I think one thing that is necessary to mention is that not not um, to try and justify these, these actions and priests being paedophiles and all that kind of stuff. No, you can't justify that. Y you can't. No. But... but it's what? a it's a fallen world, man. Yeah. We're in a fallen world. Yeah, we yeah, all yeah. sin. Yeah, we're we're all in a fallen world. And you know, you have a priest who who is had up as being a paedophile. And I don't say this in order to justify what he does, but we don't know how many times he resisted the temptation. We hear about the time when he didn't resist it. Yep. Yeah. Okay. He didn't resist it. He was wrong. He was bad, and that goes for for all of us with with when, when we're thinking about all sorts of sins. You know, how many times did you resist? Well, I resisted often, but this time I failed. Yeah, mm. that's, that's interesting. I also heard someone say once, well, he's a bad priest. He smokes cigarettes. I mean, <laughs> I mean, uh, they're they're humans. We're we're all gonna. He How? might do a lot worse things. Yeah, yeah, he could. <laughs> um, that's the least of your worries. But yeah, uh, everybody is we're part of the world, so we all we all fall somewhere. I think I think there's a difficulty there, which is what are you actually expecting the priest to do? Right now, what the priest does is he should be an example to his flock. Yes. But fundamentally what he does is certain things in church. Yeah. He hears confessions. He baptizes. But above all, he serves the liturgy, which means he makes God available for us, physically and spiritually, to be at one with Christ. Okay? Yeah. yeah. And it, we say over and over again when we're, when we're doing these things, we say... We ask for forgiveness for what we have done, and we ask that whatever it is we've done, it will not stand in the way of what we have been set apart to do. Yeah. Okay. Um, do you feel that in this day and age, with all the corruption of certain churches and certain priests, do you feel that it makes your job harder? Yes. Yes, it does. Yeah. Yes, it does. It does, yes. Because and it and there are other things too. If you have uh, a, a church which 
you can believe in the resurrection or not. You can believe in the virgin birth or not. Is that, you, is that a thing? Oh, yes, happening. Okay. Uh, you can believe in God or not. Right. Now, there are communities, churches, which where this is, this is, well, that isn't helpful at all. No. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. No. That, that's a, that goes against, no sense at all. that goes against everything we believe. Yeah. Um, so one of the things for me with, with, um, with this being made harder for you is that because of, uh, again, what what would be portrayed in the media, when people may hear about you being a priest or they'll see you, automatically they they may think certain things. Without knowing you, they'll just judge. And so I feel like sometimes it's our duty as believers who aren't priests to bridge the gap. Yes. Between. Yes. Um, and if I, we think if we think of the church as a battle. Yeah. The front rank are the lay people. Right. The second rank are the clergy to help the lay people in the front rank. Okay. And the third rank is the bishops who help the clergy to help the lay people. Yes. Right. So the lay people are in the front and the lay people need to know their faith. Yeah. They need to know. Yeah, yeah. Um, and sadly, I mean, I, I say this, I point all my fingers at myself, you know. Our generation of priests has been very bad at imparting the faith. Yeah. And I think we were talking about it earlier. I mean, many people have a, have their their understanding of their Christianity is infantile. Yeah. Infantile. They've never got beyond being seven. And the the, the riches, the wealth there is of of the most marvelous things, uh, teachings and prayers and all the rest of it. It's passed them by, and that's very sad. It is sad, and, and this is one of the reasons why I, I'm here with you today, because I feel that over the years with my, with my belief, with my faith, with my um, personal relationship with God, it's brought me to where I am now, which uh, somebody said to me not too long ago that um, you don't need God because you are a good person and you would have been that person without God. Well, actually, no, I wouldn't because there was times when I was in situations when I wanted to punch people in the face and then I remembered that actually I shouldn't do that because that's not what God would want me to do. And so we resist. A lot of, when you get further in to your faith and to your beliefs, and you build a stronger connection, your life starts to change quite drastically for the better, I believe. I've personally seen it in my life, um, and thanks to God right now, it's the best it's ever been. Um, but I've noticed with that, I've become closer to God, not because of it, I became closer to God and then more and things started falling into place and all of that. And when you say that um, certain believers uh, never pass the age of seven, it's in its infantile stages. It's sad that they will miss it when if they just tried that bit harder, it's like instead of opening the door and seeing the nice view and then closing it again or just looking at the view if you actually walk through mm. you could really enjoy everything in there that's right as opposed to just looking through the door or through the window yeah that's right and incidentally ban going from you know thing you said earlier about uh you know what what good does what good uh, does church do and so on actually if you look at christianity yeah uh, in Constantinople, in the Middle Ages, bread was free. There right. were hospitals. Yeah. There were places for uh, old people. Um, there were n that you didn't have to be a beggar because they found you somewhere to go. You right. know, the, it, so a, a thousand years ago, they had sorted those things out. 
and the many of the great things that have happened in our world. I mean, for instance, to take the, the the business of of abolishing slavery. Right. That was done by Christians. Okay. Yeah. I mean, uh, there's slavery again now, unfortunately, but and probably always has been, but it's much worse as it is. Now, if you look at atheists, right? Who are the atheists you're going to hold up? <laughs> Hitler. Yeah. Mao Zedong. Stalin. Lenin. Pol Pot. Are these examples of a good human life? Right. Yeah. I mean, again, people miss it. Yeah. You you can. I I think with not believing, again, there's there's people that say, well, I'm a good person and I don't believe and I help people where I can and well, good, etc. I'm yeah. glad they do. Yeah, but they could. It could be even better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but also, I think there's um there's quite a sense of arrogance with with that as well. Um, I think when what I personally believe um, God does for me in my life, knowing that there is somebody greater than me or something greater than me, is it makes me grateful because a lot of people that don't have that just believe all the good things that they have and they do is from them. Yeah. So, then, a... so then it comes quite a lot of arrogance with that as well, mm-hmm. which then eats away at you in other ways. Yes, and you won't even realise it. Yeah, it's true. Um, one of the other things, again, that this is quite um, a popular one for people that don't believe is, why should we believe in God or follow religion when every religion of people believe that their religion is the right one? They must all be wrong. If you were Sikh or Muslim, you'd believe that that religion was the right one. Well, it's not actually true. (laughs) Go on. Uh, Because why did Jews become Christians? They became Christians, like St. Paul and all the apostles, they became Christians because they found that there was a new religion which, building on what they already had, uh, developed it into something much greater than what they had before. Right, yeah. that's one thing. Secondly, I mean, this church is on a pagan site. Okay. Okay. Right. The pagans converted to Christianity because it was something better than what they had. Okay. Okay. So that doesn't, in fact, follow. And the other thing is that it is within many humans but i would like to say all but i i I can't because i can't speak for all but it is within many humans that they are yearning for something that actually they feel ought to be better the life ought to be better and you will say this by saying if only such and such happened then yep yeah everybody does that all the time everybody does that so we all know that there is something greater better that life could be different, could be better than it is. Okay. Now, developing from that come religions. Hello? Okay. The, the, you look at all the Eastern religions, Hinduism, uh, Taoism, uh, um, Hinduism, uh, Confucianism. They're all groping because they know that there's something there which they want to have hold of. Right. And actually, yeah. each of those religions yeah. has a found some of the truth. Okay. Okay? That's interesting. We yeah. don't deny that, you know, that, that we can't say that everything they do is totally wrong. Right. So that's ridiculous. Okay. Because they, for, for one thing, uh, they believe and teach compassion. Right. Right? Yeah. Uh, mercy. You know, right. they, they, they have these ideas. The difference with Christianity is that all those things are before the coming of Christ. After the coming of Christ, then there is a change, because here is the real truth. Right. Okay? And that develops from that. Okay. Um, A lot of people say that there is no place for religion in modern society. Well, they certainly act like that, don't they? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and what do we have? We have 
murders on the streets. We have terrorism. We have people um, self-harming. We have uh, uh, the highest number of people with mental illnesses, uh, and so on. Yes. Yeah. All, all. If they had a, if they had a better view of actually what they could achieve in their lives, um, and realize that actually they can be worthwhile people. Yeah. Um, that their life could be happy. Yeah. Then uh, they would be much better off for it. But they reject the things that allow them to actually live that. Yeah. And incidentally, when I say that, I, that is true for for other religions as well. You know, if if you were um, uh, a, a Buddhist and a good Buddhist, you actually would be able to live a more satisfying life than you would if you're just nothing. Right. Yes. Yeah. Um, not that I'm selling Buddhism to you, but I. I but I, I. But you see what I mean. So yeah. It. It isn't. It's true of religion. Religion should. Yes. High religion. High religion. Not. Not. You know, absurd paganism, which is about sacrificing animals and things. But if you have higher religion, then all those things should help people to live better and more fulfilled lives. Uh, at any rate, up to a point. A lot of people say how we're brainwashed because there's a set of rules that were implemented x amount of years ago and we basically just take them follow them and they were there to have us live a certain way and then we just followed them we didn't question it etc we do question it i question it but if you don't have it like you said You've got all these problems of the world now, which I'd say uh, there's all the time there's less people that have any belief. And then because they don't believe, then they don't have these things to follow, these morals. And then they go off the rails even more, which makes things worse. And then everybody puts it back to, well, if God's real, why is all this happening? Well, it's because you lost God in the process. People become, because people become lost in the world they become lost in themselves then um a large amount of insecurity um fills them especially nowadays with social media insecurities are tearing people apart and if people had a belief system if people had an idea that god does exist and jesus does exist and he can guide you through people i think would feel more content hmm. and more at peace however there is people that have a problem with well why should i because it's it's um it's a narrow-minded way of thinking hmm. well it is true and of course one of the difficulties now for us is that there are so many things that people could do. And this is new. This is a new thing which our world is having to deal with. Okay. So, for instance, look at the amount of stuff that goes on on a Sunday morning. Right. I remember a time when on a Sunday morning the whole place closed down. Some people went to church. Some people just stayed at home and stayed in bed. Yeah. But now you can go shopping. You can go to football matches. You can go to, you know, loads, loads and loads and loads and loads yeah. and loads of things yeah. that you can do. Um, when you think that some of the some of the fathers, like St. John Chrysostom, um, he said, well, what you need to do if you're, if you're getting bored is you must come to a church vigil. Okay. <laughs> yes. Right. This was entertainment. Right. And it is entertainment, of course. It is entertainment. Um, but there's lots of other entertainment. Now, that's partly a problem because they don't therefore want to get involved with religious things because they'd much rather, I don't know, go fishing. Yeah, yeah. Um, th th this is the thing I think sometimes when uh, what we believe or what we follow doesn't suit the lifestyle that you wish to live yeah. then they just turn it on what we believe and say it's wrong when actually if you if you don't want to follow because you want to live some reckless type of way then that's that's on you, but you can't you can't blame what we believe. No, and it's it's, it's lack of commitment actually, isn't it? Yeah, um, because a lot of people want to take drugs and sleep around and 
gamble and all these kind of things which if they believed they may not do or have a guilty conscience about when they do do it and so to not have that problem they just won't believe yep it just makes life easier for them yep but in actual fact if that's the mentality you've got just admit that that's what it is and don't don't turn it around and say that this kind of stuff about what we believe because it's on you at the end of the day mm. um one thing i did want to mention which uh what i call my right hook in a debate um is the holy light in jerusalem i feel like i know that there is many miracles that go on which never get spoken about the reason why i spoke about the holy light is because it happens every year on a set date and thousands of people every year go to see it um and it's something that other religions don't have can you talk about that all right well let's explain what happens so in jerusalem at pascha at easter uh the in the church of the holy sepulchre there is the place where there is the stone where christ was laid by the disciples when he after he was taken down from the cross okay yeah so it's the actual place where the resurrection happened yeah and of course there's no physical christ there there is an empty tomb which we believe in now then what happens at at, at pascha is that the patriarch goes in with some bunches of candles he is supervised uh, before he goes in to ensure that there is no uh, box of matches or blowtorch or whatever it is. Lighters. Lighters or yeah. anything else. In he goes and uh, there is a, a pause very often and then suddenly he comes out with the, the candles he's taken in a light. This is passed to the other people who have um, uh, bunches of candles and it spreads. And it seems that this is a very odd fire because it is cool rather than hot. Right. Can we can we just we just make sure we pick up on that that this fire doesn't seem to burn people if they put their hands in it or their faces in it? No. Okay. No. So it it's a uh, it's um uh, seen as a, a miraculous thing. Now I I would say about this that y you need to go and see it. You need to go and and experience this you've I mean, experienced it i haven't experienced it no but i, I know about it right I, I mean i'm quite happy to believe that this happens i'm not that's yeah, not yeah. A problem yeah, yeah um but then i believe because a lot of other things i know happen so for instance in this church people come who are ill and they are healed okay right? it's an it's normal right um and this has happened a few times hasn't and this it? has happened lots of times right this has happened lots of times so miracles happen it it, it is it is a fact of our existence that is what happens they right. come and they have got brain tumors or they've got uh cancers or whatever it is and uh, rashes or all sorts of things and they're healed so i'm not i don't have any problem with mir miracles right happening yeah 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 um I, I i feel like certain things are are put in place miracles are put in place by god to uh, a to strengthen our beliefs our faith um for us that do believe already and also for people that don't believe to yeah. see it and and capture that however and incidentally ban remember that there are not miracles for everybody because right because actually everybody is going to die yeah, yeah 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 so they are not kept to live through miracles in per perpetuity yes right yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> so but um, I, I've, I take comfort in this idea that, you know, a man is immortal until his work is done. That's interesting. And I like that. You know, I, one has to say that some people seem to be kept alive when in normal circumstances they would have died years before. Right. And they suffer. And yeah. And that's very sad. Again, again, sometimes you're better off to go when you go. And I think that sometimes um, when people die at a certain age and people say well he uh he was young or or it was too early too soon you don't know what could have become if he was still alive 
No. And sometimes maybe the blessing that you don't know by God is that he took him at that point before something became worse of him. He may have, I don't know, for example, got, he was a good person, he got hit by a car and he died. Whereas if he didn't get hit by that car, in five years' time, he may have ended up with a major drug addiction and murdered somebody. You don't know. You don't no, know. No, and it's worth pointing out that death is in fact a gift because it stops evil being perpetual. Okay. So every human who dies, whatever evil, whatever sin there is with them, it's gone. Right. It's finished. Okay. It doesn't go on. Yeah. And that's a good thing. Okay. Um. Yeah, and what what you said before about um, not not to keep living, we again because when when people die and somebody close to them is upset about it and then they turn away from God or they turn away from the church. Um, not to sound unsympathetic to these situations, but we've all got to die one day, hmm? and. I guess it's it's a fact of life. For what reason, we don't know, but it, it's got to be done. And sometimes... Well, I we wear out. Say again? We wear out. Yeah, we do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and I think sometimes it's it's hard for people to um, keep their faith when it was someone so close to them. And especially if they well, were... Some do, but you know, some some people are, are actually... They... they, they, they their faith is in, increased. Yeah. So, it, it, it do, but all things, all these things are different. Yeah, They're yeah. Different for each individual. Right, I agree. Um, before my quick fire questions, is there anything you would like to touch on? Um, let's leave it for the next one. Okay, okay. <laughs> there could be a part two, so keep that in mind. Um. So a couple of quick fire questions. If you weren't doing this, if you weren't a priest and you could do anything in the world, it didn't matter about education, uh, where you live, anything like that, what would you do? Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> I don't know that I really want to do anything other than what I do, you know. What? What? <laughs> You've got to, I, you got I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm a very, I'm very content as a priest. I, I but what I, you've got to, you've got to give me something. What would, <laughs> what, what would be number two on the list? Mm. I'd keep a second-hand bookshop. A second-hand bookshop, <laughs> really. <laughs> You're, you're a reader, aren't you? I am. Yes. You you can't you can't see on the camera, but that this is just at the top of the church, and there is a lot of books here. It's like a sm <laughs> it's like a small library. You read all of these? Uh, well, not all of these ones, no. But I I do read a lot of books. How many books do you read, like on average? Well, I suppose a I year, read probably two books a week. Two books a week? Oh my days! Wow. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what what advice would you give? 18-year-old Stephen? Well, I think I would say to take more more concern about... I mean, we're talking about sort of A-levels, aren't we? You know... At that age, yeah. Yeah, to do... To actually take the the... What you're taught more seriously, and there are so many distractions when you you at that age, you know, there are girls yep. and things and, and there are parties and stuff. Actually, to take what you're being taught uh, more seriously and get knuckled down and do more work. Okay. Because uh, there are things when which I think back on and I think, oh, if only I'd taken a little bit more trouble, I would be able to re to, to sort that out. Right. Better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In hindsight. In hindsight, yeah. yes. I mean, for instance, languages. I wish I'd taken more trouble with languages. But, okay. Uh, languages didn't seem to matter then. I, you know, everybody spoke English, didn't they? Right. And, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, no, they didn't. No, no, they didn't. Uh, no, they didn't. And, and they don't <laughs> now, still. <laughs> no. And and to have learned, to have really got to grips with a language would have been, another language would have been, I think, a, a, a something that I should have done. So there are things that, that's what I would say. But you, as but it, Would I have taken any notice? 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's it's interesting um looking back now how your understanding and how your interests develop. Whereas at eighteen, even I'm only twenty nine, so it was only eleven years ago, but even still for me there's there's been a big change. Yes. Um but yeah, the things that concern us now at eighteen didn't concern us. That's right. That's right. Right. Well, um to wrap up I want to thank you massively because, again, um, this isn't something that a lot of people in your position would do. Um, well, you're very welcome. You've opened up the church for us and you've we've touched on subjects that a lot of people and even people in your position would avoid. So um, I th- thank you for that. Um, it's been a pleasure and an honour. Um, it's been very insightful for me. I'm sure a lot of people will take away from this as well. Um, I hope people have got a better understanding now, even if they still don't believe, which again, each to their own. Um, But as long as people can say, do you know what, this argument that I had against why they follow or why they believe, I now understand why they do. Even though I don't, I understand why they do. And I think that is something because... Um, I feel like sometimes people that don't believe and they have this they have this um, understanding or what they believe is an understanding of why we do follow. When they talk negatively about it, somebody else listening may then be swayed mm. in that direction also. Um, so if they no longer have that strong opinion, then I think we've done something. All right. Um Anybody wanting to visit this church, it's Dove Close SY26FB in Shrewsbury, Shropshire. Um, on Facebook, it's the Greek Orthodox Church, Shrewsbury. The website is www.shrewsburyorthodox.com. The links will be in the descriptions on YouTube. Um, uh, once again, Father Stephen Maxfield is in the chair with the barber. My name is Banigolau. Stay tuned and you'll see me soon. Yeah. <laughs>